morning, everyone. Good morning. Come on, you guys can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So first of all, I just, I am humble. I am humble to just be here in front of you. Um, inner city kid, born in Mexico. My dad never made more than $7 an hour. And you know, he's now like, he died in 2008. But then he's looking at me now and just probably in awe um, about what I've been able to accomplish with his guidance and, our, and, and, and what our family's been able to do. Before I start, I, I just would uh, like our SISD team to stand up because we have uh, several of our uh, key members from my cabinet that are here. And I just ask them to stand and please recognize them, please. I feel so blessed to have such an amazing board. They are all passionate. They understand the challenges we have. They understand the opportunities that we have. And more importantly, they never lose sight of the children that we are serving. And I'll tell you, to have a united board with different backgrounds, very smart, very accomplished individuals, um, I gotta say, it's somewhat unique. It's somewhat unique, and so I just feel very blessed. So, what I wanna share with you today is what I call the second phase of our work. So in the first phase, and again, we always start with our mission, right? And Ms. Rado uh, said about what we want to accomplish with all of our children. So in the first, uh, you know, when, as you look at our district in the past, what drove our work was the fact that we had such low, unacceptable uh, graduation rates. Back in 2008, we were below 60%. So only about you know, five out of 10 children were graduating. Today, we're just over eight out of 10 children. And again, that number is going to continue to get better. But here's what's driving our work now. So overall proficiency rate right now is about 53%. Our advanced children are in the single digits. By the way, countywide, we're not much better. We're not much better. So I want us to understand that and put that in context. Of our children that are graduating, if everybody took the exams based on the class of 2015, we only had 3% of our children that were college ready. Not everybody took the exam, but even those that took the exam, it was only 4%. Right? So unacceptably low. Look at our real low proficiency. Significant achievement gaps. We have over 10,000 students that are active English language learners, which means that they, uh, English is their second language. I'm an English language learner. So when I came to this country at age five, I knew no English. I started in first grade, um, so I had no preschool, no kindergarten foundations. And, you know, in Chicago, they didn't have any, any yellow programs. They didn't have any bilingual programs. So I was just put in a classroom with all English speakers. I remember just being silent. I literally said nothing, because I was scared of that. I just literally didn't say anything, and the teachers didn't know what to do with me. They didn't know if there was something wrong with me, and, you know, if I was maybe cognitively disabled. They didn't know what to do with me. And finally, over time, they figured it out. Um, so, you know, I think about that experience when I think about our 10,000 children that are English language learners, and we have huge achievement gaps. And look at our achievement gaps with special ed. So I say that to you, that's what's starting to drive our work for the next five years. So I talk about our phase. So phase, phase one, I started, um, I became superintendent uh, here in June. Uh, so this is month eight for me. By July 21st, our cabinet, our team had put together a set of goals that we presented to the board uh, on July 21st. And these goals did a couple of things for us. First of all, um, you know, when you look at our mission about being, being a national urban school, we said, well, how are we gonna measure that? Right? So how are we going to make sure that when I tell you that, okay, this is where San Antonio ISD wants to be, again, what is that picture you're going to have? Right? Is it going to be kids playing sports? Is it going to be children being actively engaged? Is it them graduating? Is it them going to college? Is it going to a tier one university? How are we going to measure that? So we set our goals out, and more than half, so the majority of our goals are targeted towards children that not only are at level, but how to get them to advance. So for example, we have a target to have 30% of our students to be at the advanced level. By the way, that's significantly higher than the county and the state. We, we put as a floor that we will not accept having children that can't pass the advanced placement exams. 
which right now is less than 15% of our children can pass an ethnicity test. Uh, that uh, we have to have matched the national averages and children could be in college ready for ACT and SAT. And we did that on purpose because again, the previous work that we had done had gotten us, helping us to get children that were severely behind and moving them up. This is now the next level of work. So this was the first, I call this the first phase. We rolled out these goals, uh, first with our board, we met with our principals, we developed goals at the campus level, and we did five-year plans with the campuses, and then they started working as a team on their year one strategic plan. Went out to the community, had eight community meetings, including one that was all in Spanish for our Spanish-speaking parents. Got very positive support. So now, our colleague and I were in phase two of the work. So we set our goals, very aggressive. Some people said, you know, superintendent, ah, God, this seems pretty unrealistic, considering where you guys are at. And we said, well, give us a little bit of time. Give us a little bit of time. So now, phase two of the work, we're now uh, unveiling our strategies of how we're gonna get to those goals. And what we did is we designed five pillars. So to group our strategies, so that um, you know, as you look at the work that we're doing, we can talk about whether it's academic excellence or talent management or how we're going to engage stakeholders or making sure that we're managing our resources well, right? That we're aligning our resources, um, and so and of course our culture shift. So first of all, academic excellence. So on your table, you have these pamphlets. These are our, our magnet programs that are being rolled out this week. As we speak right now, 8th grade and ninth grade counselors are collaborating, working with our students in the middle schools. And we have magnet programs, and keep in mind, what a magnet program means is that parents can go to these programs regardless of where they live. So every one of our comprehensive high schools has a magnet program, and what's, here's what's great about the magnet programs. If our children get into them, and we lay out the course sequence for the next four years. So what we're sending a message to parents saying, look, hold us accountable. And our goal is that if a child gets into one of these magnet programs, they will have at least up to 45 college credit hours. So one of the things that our data showed is that of the children that are going to college, the majority of them need a remediation. So they were starting behind. By the way, it's a national issue. It's a national issue. So we said, you know what? How do we fix that? Well, you know how you fix that? Children have to start ahead. That's the way you fix it. And what's interesting now, we're having different sets of conversations of because our magnets are revolving around healthcare and Edison and at Fox Tech. They revolve around engineering programs at Lanier, at Sam Houston, at Highlands. We're gonna have a new international baccalaureate high school at Jefferson High School. Uh, Burbank, of course, has been already a very strong uh, international baccalaureate high school. So, so we're putting these programs and what we're saying is, look, Let's make sure that as we're working with the children in the middle school, that they know about these options. In fact, we're working with the Alamo system to bring kids onto their campuses so they can see the amazing things that are going on. I don't know if you guys have been to the Alamo, system, uh, the Alamo campuses. Go to St. Phillips. They have a building. It looks like an office building on the outside. It literally is a hospital. You walk in there, they have all the latest technology of any hospital. Go into their plant, into their uh, manufacturing facility, uh, their auto manufacturing, where they partner with Toyota, Ford, and General Motors, where they actually send the workers to get trained on the latest technology, right? SAC has very similar, similar uh, great facilities, great programs. So is Palo Alto. So we're doing this, we want to expose our children, and, you know, and we have these conversations about, well, how do you expect, you know, Superintendent Martinez to make a 12 year old is going to make a decision to go to healthcare or engineering? And I said, well, here's the thing. Worst case scenario. They go into healthcare, find out that they hate blood, right? They find out, you know, they, they do an internship at one of the hospitals, find out that they just hate blood, they want to faint. They found that in high school. Ladies and gentlemen, when are children finding that out now, in college? Why does it take six years now for children to graduate from college? Why, does it, why do children have to take up loans or parents paying out money and children sometimes are taking majors three or four times, right? So let's have them have those conversations now. Um, and what we have done is we designed our high school program so that every incoming ninth grader, so if they want to go into an early college program, we have three of them, they get an associate's degree coming out of high school. If they're going to go into our magnets, 45 college credit hours. And then we also have our programs that we're very well known for, like animal science and architecture. Those programs are there, but those programs they can get up to 30 college credit hours. That's what we're doing. 
So he said, okay, but how are the kids going to be ready for this, right? What we're doing is we're redesigning the middle schools. We're putting in place more pre-advanced placement programs. Three of our middle schools next year will be, uh, are going to be going for their international baccalaureate certificates. We'll have the most uh, IB middle schools in the county. And by the way, we're not stopping there. In the next few years, you'll see elementary schools will become certified uh, for the international baccalaureate program. The international baccalaureate program is one of the most uh, uh, difficult processes to get certified for. Children that graduate with an IB diploma can pretty much get into any top college of your choice, period. And so we will have two high schools next fall that we're going up to be going for the candidacy. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, we're looking, we're implementing, making sure that more of our children are exposed to algebra by eighth grade. If you ask a university, any national university, what is their biggest predictor, best predictor for children succeeding and graduating from college in a timely manner? They will tell you where they start out in math and how they, if they can get to the math courses. Those are the biggest challenges for our children. That's usually where they have the most remediation. And frankly, for many of our children, there's such big stumbling blocks that they actually drop out um, or don't finish on time. And then here's what's really exciting. Um, we're going to be developing two gifted academies. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about how they're going to fit into our human capital talent management. Um, two gifted academies um, that we will, we will be announcing the locations in the next month. And I'll talk a little bit more in detail. But here's what's also exciting. This year, as we speak, we are providing, a, we're doing a universal screener for all of our first and fifth graders so that we will identify all of our children that are gifted. And here's what happens with children that live in poverty. 93% of our children live in poverty. The traditional ways of identifying children for gifted, um, frankly, don't work for children in poverty. I walk into classrooms and picture the teacher going through, through you know, the work. Um, I will look at a check out that the teacher maybe is on problem one. Some of the children already have finished. They're already on problem six. And they're waiting for the teacher, right? But they're very compliant. They're very, you know, they're very polite. They don't say anything. And I say, hey, so you know, you know, you're done, huh? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just waiting. You know? And again, they're bored. They're bored, right? But they're very, and when they're small, you know, they're, they're, they stay compliant. As they get older, folks, and I thought sort of physical, they don't stay compliant. And that's when you see them act up. But these are children that, frankly, are academically uh, so advanced, and they're frustrated. So our universal screeners will be identifying these children. We will then be providing uh, services for them throughout the district. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and here's where the foundations have to start. Um, we are putting our stake in the ground in ensuring that every child that is in our system, they have to be delivered by third grade. We have right now, ladies and gentlemen, and, and, I, and I, it, it, it is such a struggle. We have a 17 year old at one of my middle schools, you know, at Canal Middle School. I have another 17 year old at Irving Middle School. These children have been retained three to four times. They have, these children, even though they're physically in our building, they dropped out years ago. They have literally dropped out years ago. We have significant retention rates. Um, we were retaining children too much. The reason we have challenges in ELL and special ed is because we're not dealing with the challenges at the right time. And that's in that pre-K to three area. We are blessed in this community that we have preschool programs. In Nevada, we had none. We had none. We had no preschool programs. Children were starting in kindergarten or in first grade. By law, they didn't have to start until age six in school. Here, we're getting children as early as age three. So what we're doing is saying, look, let's look at what's going on, and let's really understand our children. Let's really, because it's not, it's not always necessarily that we have bad strategies, but let's understand who our children are. So for example, if I'm giving a lot of homework to a second grader, and I don't know that family, and maybe that second grader has five siblings, and they live in a one-bedroom apartment, right, and, the, and parents, maybe it's a single parent, or both parents are working the third shift, we better know that. Right? We better know that so they can shape our work. Or if it's a it's an older student and they're the oldest sibling and they're babysitting, right? While, while the parents are working, or maybe again it's a single parent, we better know that. We're living in an apartment, and I don't know about you guys, so for me, I grew up, you know, I'm the oldest of ten kids. My family was poor. And every year when the landlord would figure out how many kids were in, in, you know, in the house, we had to move. It's just that my parents were very astute. They knew where, the, where my school was at, and it wasn't a great school, but they always made sure that I was near close enough so they could stay in the same school. They said, well, at least do that. Make sure we have, we have some stability. But every year, we were moving. 
So that's our world. And, it, and what I tell our staff is embrace that. Don't make excuses. Embrace that. Know that. Then let's make sure we shape the work around that. And so our literacy initiative, we're going to be investing quite a bit of money. Because it's not cheap, but I'll tell you, it's the most cost-effective, most efficient way to meet the needs of our children at this early age. By the time these children are 17 years old and they're still in middle school, again, dropped out three or four years ago. Right? And so now we're struggling with that 17-year-old. Nothing is going to happen without um, our, our ensuring that we have the right talents in our schools. And it's about leadership. So who are the challenges we have? So our county, as an example, um, hires uh, annually over 3,000 teachers. The suppliers of those teachers, which is UTSA, Texas, uh, Texas State, and a few other universities, are the main suppliers for this area. They supply about 2,000 teachers annually. So think about that for a second. On an annual basis, in our county, we're short about 1,000 teachers. And we're all struggling. And by the way, we start speaking from each other, right? So and I have a lot of respect for Dr. Woods, but going inside, you know, to get to that time of the year, all right, start making those phone calls, right? All of a sudden, you know, they're taking some of our teachers. Then we're doing the same thing to some of the other districts, by the way. And then we're going to the border towns and we're spending teachers from there. So that's what's happening. Or we have a word, uh, getting teachers through a third certification program. So, you know, TFA is a huge partner for us. And this, and, but again, they're a very small fraction of the teachers that we hire. And so we're doing, we say, you know what? We gotta solve this, right? We can't accomplish our strategies if we can't even provide strong teachers in every classroom. So what we're doing is right now we're working with a group of very, um, you know, of donors. So remember what I said about the gifted programs? So the two gifted academies, when we're designing them, they will have a residence model. A master teacher with a resident teacher that will be trained that teacher will be getting their master's degree, and right now we're partnering with that program Trinity, amazing partner, and we'll be supplying teachers to the rest of our district for our gifted program. And one of the things I'll just tell you right now, as a county, as a state, I would, and I'm still learning, I don't know everything, but I will tell you that I don't think we serve our advanced children very well. And I, and I just see the data. Because we lag the nation in almost every measure when it comes to advanced academics. Whether it's AP, whether it's ACT, SAT, we lag the nation. So that to me tells me we don't serve our advanced children well enough. So there, this will become a supplier for teachers for the entire district. Then we're not stopping there. We're now also talking to the donors again about building a residency program for all of our other teacher needs. So that we will have individuals who made their graduate from UTSA, right? Grew up in San Antonio. And, you know, they want to try teaching. They get to be a resident teacher for a year, get their master's degree, and we get a chance to see them for that year to see, right, if this is, you know, if they're the right fit for us. They get to see if this is what they like. So we've been studying the, net, the residency programs across the country because these are starting now to develop. And I'll tell you, retention rates over 70 to 80 percent. 70 to 80 percent. Because these individuals, once they decide that this is what they want to do, guess what? They have that passion. And especially working in inner city schools, it's a different experience, ladies and gentlemen. It is a different experience. Because we have to ensure that we, again, we know our families, we know what's going on at home, so that we can shape our work to make sure that they're successfully, that they're, they accomplish, they're, they can be successful academically. Uh, as we speak this month, we have an RP, we have a very generous donor, the HUB Foundation, amazing. Um, Charles Bud has been an amazing, amazing ally for us. Uh, has provided us funding to develop a residency program for principals, right? So, I mean, basically, if you think about what's going on is, we're taking some of the best practices, effectively, we're developing the medical field, right? Because the residence programs are not brand new. I mean, they've been in the medical field forever, and we're bringing that into education. And I will just tell you, that is the national trend right now in education. So we're creating a residence program where principals will be in residence for a year before, before they become official principals. There is no successful school in the country that does not have a great principal. Great teachers follow great leaders. If you ask a teacher right now, top five, where does money rank in your decision of where to work? They will say, it is five. Number one is the leader. They will commute an hour both ways, each way, to work for a strong leader. By the way, you guys are probably the same, same, same way, right? 
That's what drives, you know, our teachers. So the residence program will be announcing more details at the end of this month. Here's an interesting one as well. So, you know, remember what I said about shortage of hiring teachers? So if you want one sure way to not have the highest quality teachers, just hire me. Just hire me. And so, um, and our entire program does, does amazing work, by the way. But here's the challenge that I gave them. I said, you know, I want, we hire about 400, 500 teachers, including TFA, every year. I said, I would like at least, you know, as much as possible, uh, close to half of our teachers hired by April. And so last year, just to give you numbers, we hired 29. Our goal is to hire 240 by April. We're already on track to exceed that number as of right now. We've already reached more than half of that. Well, we're actually finding talented teachers. Some of them are already doing student teaching in our buildings. We're going in and observing them, and we're making, we're locking them in right now to be part of our district. So again, changing the way we do our work. Um, none of this is going to happen without partnering with several key partners. So we are partnering with UTSA. We're partnering with Texas A&M here in San Antonio, the Alamo College system. We are bringing people to the table. I thought I already shared with you the partnership we have with Trinity around our gifted programs. We are bringing the smartest people in our community to work with us. And I'll tell you, my hope today is that you're going to partner with us. Because as I talk about our children as they matriculate through our magnet programs, I want them to have a real life experience of what it means to be in the healthcare field. I want them to have a real life experience of what it means to be in engineering. Right? I want them to understand it. Because 93% of our children live in poverty. The majority of those children qualify for Head Start, which is the lowest, the lowest poverty guidelines, uh, the most strictest poverty guidelines that we have in the country. Those guidelines have not been updated in years. You have to be, folks, you have to be really poor to qualify for Head Start. This is not just poor. You have to be really poor. We qualify for Head Start, my family, when I grow up. That's how poor you have to be. That's the majority of our children. And so I can't assume that our children are going to have the supports at home for no fault of their parents, by the way. My parents did the best they could. They just didn't know what they didn't know. So again, that has to shape our work. One of the things that uh, is on your table is this Texas College comparison that we partner with, with Kip here in San Antonio, who does an amazing job of matching kids with colleges. So we said, you know, who's doing this really well? And we found out, hey, Kip is doing it really well. So my staff were surprised when all of a sudden we had a, a we took a trip to Kip. They're like, why are we going to Kip? Why are we going to Kip? I said, wait, let's go, let's go see you. And so we developed this chart that shows the GPA and the ACT and SAT requirements for each of our colleges here in Texas. This is now being distributed to every one of our students in every, in every high school grade. So that when a child says, you know, superintendent, I'm gonna be a doctor. I said, okay, so what does that mean to you? Right, what kind of courses are you gonna have to take for that? What are the best colleges for that? So what does that really mean? Again, if it's a family that's a middle class family, you can make certain assumptions that that family will guide their child through that. The families that we're serving, our children, I can't make that assumption. So that means we have to put these structures in place and we have to put them in early. So that a child, when they're going through their senior years in high school, and all of a sudden they said, you know, I really want to go into the medical field, but they don't have the grades to get into a top college. They're starting with mediation, right? Think about then what happens to that child. Think about how they become demoralized. And then you wonder why we have communities that haven't at all. Right? Children that are graduated and they're living on the west side or on the east side or the southeast side. And they didn't reach their dreams. And by the way, now they have children. And now we're, being, we're working with those parents. Right? And so it's, it's, a, it's a dynamic that we have. And so for us, again, we got to work, you know, we got to start early and again, shape our work around that. Um, we are, again, these, you know, in order for us to accomplish these strategies, we have to align our resources. Um, and there's one thing I'm going to ask, you know, this group, and I'll tell you, our board has a lot of courage. We have a lot of tough conversations. Because, you know, the strategies may look good, they may look good on paper. What it means is a lot of changes. What it means is getting staff retrained. What it means is changing belief systems. Having tough conversations. When we walk into a classroom and we don't see kids engaged, or we see children that have checked out and nobody has cared. 
or they left the building and nobody noticed. Right? It's those tough conversations. <laughs> Working with parents sometimes, you know, who we're trying to make sure they raise their expectations. Right? Because again, they didn't have a good experience. So they're thinking, hey, I just want to get them through high school. I said, no. In today's economy, your child's not going to be successful. In today's economy, if they don't have some college experience, they're not going to have a middle class life. And this cycle of poverty will continue. So I just want to you know, make sure you know that because that's the hard work that's going on. And I can't do it without a United Board. I can't do it without a strong team because those are the tough changes we have. And that's really around what we talk about when we talk about culture shift. Our board, just to send a strong message to the community, just approved the resolution uh, recently to become a district of innovation. And I got to tell you, what that means is that, you know, that is going to be one of our key levers. That we have to make sure that when we're working with our campuses, that we're problem solving. Again, that we're understanding the children we're serving. That we're shaping our work around it. Um, and that was a big step. Um, the, so, one of the things that I, that's interesting about our district, that not everybody knows, but we have some very good performing schools right now. In fact, I'm one of the leaders, National Blue Ribbon School. Nadia, who is the head of our student council from that school, just got accepted into Yale. We have some really, we have some amazing children. We have great success stories. What's interesting about all six of these schools is, you know, Halton, for example, well, became an industry charter over a decade ago. You know, Bonham, who has a waiting list for kids to get in, our dual language school, um, has been an innovative charter school for, more, again, for years. Young women leaders, like I said, uh, we have an amazing uh, board. By the way, uh, let me acknowledge also our uh, Sanitary Foundation Board. Um, I would like to understand that, if you don't mind, because they have been partners with us through every step of the way. So please, I just want to acknowledge our San Antonio ISD. <laughs> They are thought partners. Not only do they help us uh, uh, you know, get more resources for our schools, they're literally thought partners as we're going through this work. But again, we have a history of innovation in our district. And it's been working. <laughs> so you know, what I want to leave you is a last comment before we go into Q&A. Um, we, what we're doing is we're taking this to scale. We want to be bold. <laughs> we want to be aggressive. Um, and I'll tell you, and I'm going to say this on behalf of the board. Um, when these changes start occurring, it's critical that our community is behind us. Because, you know, I, I, I joke about this. I said, their trucks are going to come up. I've been doing this for a long time. Their trucks are going to come up. I don't know when. I don't know what's going to set them off. Every community is a little different, you know. But they're going to come. I was here before I started as superintendent, um, the week before, I was in a board meeting. And the board had made shifts to 20 principles. So 20 principles were being changed. People were in that room. By the way, we never looked at the academic data, the fact that children were not doing well, and we basically told our board, we know where you live. <laughs> Ed, Ed was the board president at the time. We know where you run. <laughs> the audience, and, you know, I liked it by this, so I have so much appreciation for the work he's done. Um, you know, his, his work allowed me to really get aggressive in our the work we're doing now. He started getting with the word. He said, hey, I was in the audience. I was watching you guys. Um, but I mean, it was, the pitch rocks were up, ladies and gentlemen. And our board stood solid. They did the right thing. Pitch rocks are going to come up. We're going to need the community. We're going to need the community behind us because to get to these goals, to implement these strategies, it is transforming the district. There is no other way to get there. So again, thank you. I'm just so humbled to be here with you. And I know we're going to go to some Q&A, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so it's getting a little late. So maybe we can do one or two questions. Does anybody have a question or two that they'd like to pose to our new superintendent?
Yeah, so, so here, here's what's Yeah, yeah, so the question is, you know, as you look at our students that are going through our high school programs, as we're redesigning, will the college hours also get them to certificates? And it's a great question. The way we're designing the programs, they will have stackable degrees. So for example, they will get certificates, they will be able to get close to an associate's degree, especially in the magnet, because I have 45 college hours. And then what we're making sure, and this is where again the partnerships are really key, is we're leveraging the relationships that Alamo has with UTSA and with Texas A&M. So that those hours transfer easily so that the children can get a bachelor's degree very quickly. So that's part of the business plan program. So thank you, great question. Excellent, we got one more back here, that'll be the last one. Great question. So, you know, so here's the here's one of the things that we do. Yeah. So the question is, what has been the response of our teachers and principals to this plan? So, so you know, I'll share with you. And, and a lot of it has been the way we've done the work. So when we laid out our goals, so again, we started with the board on the 21st. The next day, we started a week long uh, set of trainings and works with our principals. We went through our data in detail at the student level. And then we had to bring teams at each school level to develop their goals and plans. As we talked about our strategies, for example, I met with every high school team to talk about, look, here's the vision that we have. Tell me right now what concerns you have. So we've been very inclusive in how we've done the work. Um, again, the next step after this, we're going to go out to the community. We're actually, and our teachers and principals, they're part of the community, right? I mean, they're part of, you know, many of them live in our area, so they're part of the community. So we are working very hard, not only to make sure that we have good strategies, but that we're inclusive, that we're getting feedback, we're adjusting things as we need. So because of that, you know, it's been very positive, but I will say this, there's a very healthy tension, right? There is a very healthy tension, because it's very clear the direction we're going, and they know that that means that there's gonna be changes. Changes in the way we teach, changes in the curriculum, what we teach, changes in the way we, we deal with talent management. Um, so, so again, it's a very healthy tension. So great question. Great. Let's give a better one another round of applause. Better with a book on behalf of the community. It's called Blended Using Disruptive Innovation to Improve Schools. Not that you don't have enough to read, uh, but just another opportunity to you know, pull those best practices that are working throughout the nation. Clearly, you're doing something very special here. Uh, your board is united. They are focused on providing you with the kind of support you need to make it happen. And you have now a, a community that's here to help you as well. Congratulations. Thank you. Being here, we're going to close the program. I just want to tell you just a couple quick things. February the second, we are having a citywide job shadow day through our SA Works program. We're going to have uh, 1,700 kids visiting 59 different employers, and some of you all, some of your employers are here in this room today. Young people going out to do exactly what you're doing, and that is giving them the opportunity to learn what businesses do, the different businesses that are out there, so they can learn and figure out exactly what they want to do for the rest of their life. You know, tasting all these flavors of ice cream, you figure out one that you like, and that's what we're trying to do with these young people, giving them the opportunity to learn and to find their career and move forward. So that's February the second. There's still a lot of opportunities for more businesses to, to help and to bring kids to your campus so we can help you. And then we also launched our SA Works uh, website, www.sanantonioworks.org so that we can get you all to sign up and help us connect businesses to young people so that we can do exactly what Pedro was outlined, that is giving inspirational learning opportunities to young people. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to our first uh, event of the year, and we stand adjourned.